afternoon to all of you. Thank you for inviting me to share a little bit of some ideas about, uh, about what we do and about the challenges that we face. The first four or five slides I will just, they are here just for a matter of record, so I'll pass it very fast. Then I will try to use my time in what is specific to, to what I pretend to share with the audience. Um, this is what we all know, which is good news, that, uh, that uh, our business, our business, we've got our, our grandchildren will work in oil and gas, as you can see from the projections of supply and demand. These are public numbers. Uh, we, that says also that the market share of the oil and gas industry in the total primary energy will probably decline from 53% to 51%, which means that we'll have a major role to play throughout, uh, throughout the forthcoming decades. Um, this is well known for a lot of us. This is, is that uh, we still, we have a lot, of, a lot of work to do to compensate for the depletion of the existing reservoirs. And there are many options that we are uh, in the industry developing. These are fundamentally data from the, 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 uh, the International Energy Agency. These are no, no which is, is important to note is the, the weight of the, the natural gas liquids in the supply of liquid fuels to the, to the, to the industry, which is something that we not every time uh, look carefully. The declination of the reservoirs are particularly more relevant in the non-OPEC countries, and we all know that from our own experience, um, fundamentally because in the, in the non-OPEC countries, we tend to deplete the reservoirs faster. Uh, our industry has been investing a lot of money uh, in the last couple of years, uh, on average about uh, 700 billion dollars a year is quite quite a number, uh, much higher than in the in the middle of the decade, the past decade, and uh, and uh, as we all know, uh, the the majors in particular are, get, are at this moment trying to contain this investment for reasons that we are also familiar with. That's where I want to start. This uh, is probably a surprise for many. It gives you the weight of the deep water discoveries in the total discoveries that we have <coughs> had since 2006. It could have been from another year, but that's where we, our database went to. In 2012, 80% of the new oil and gas discovered was in deep and ultra deep offshore. And is a trend, as you can see, is, 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 is relevant. No? That uh, blue line indicates in the numbers that are on top of it, um, uh, they are all of them 74%, 43%, 80%. So we can see that industry as a whole is bringing new resources that they, uh, from uh, deep and ultra deep offshore. Um, another material data, if we, if we focus on 2012, not far away, and look at the largest discoveries, the largest 10 discoveries in the world, you can see that um, that uh, that uh, practically all of them uh, are uh, are uh, are in deep water, no? which is which is uh, material. No? If we go back to the to, to 011, we've got only three, four discoveries of the big discoveries that were not in deep water. So if you just this slide, if you see in 2012. In 2012, all of them were in deep and ultra deep water, the large discoveries. We say large discoveries, something close to 1 billion barrels recoverable plus. I think the, the break point is about, is about 700 in 2012. And in 2011, you see that only four of those are not in ultra deep offshore. By the way, our little logo, uh, we are fortunate enough to, to be present in the, uh, some of the most relevant discoveries that happened in ultra deep offshore. This tells us also another graph, again, this is from, from the International Energy Agency, saying that today the ultra deep offshore represents 7% of the production. But uh, its market share, if we call it that way, will evolve very fast, and the projects are there to be developed, are under development to a market share uh, close to 15%. And, um, and by the way, I was hearing the discussion on conventionals, on non-conventionals. Uh, these are effectively competitive because
because the productivity of the wells in Northern Deep Offshore uh, is fantastic and c more than compensates the, um, the, 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 the incremental capex, not opex, but capex. Uh, we that are most familiar with Northern Deep Offshore, uh, I recently <laughs> made an announcement, we connected one well in, in, in one platform in Brazil called the Cidade Paraty, the productivity per well is 20, 26,000 barrels a day, and we are slightly disappointed, no? So, so that's uh, the kind of language that we talk. So it's, uh, so, and we see every, every well that we drill is drilled, sh is, you see the sophistication of drilling technology is fantastic. It's every time we are reducing the drilling time per well, and now actually it was also announced recently that uh, the drill that, the well that was drilled recently in another field called Iracema, um, 6,000 meters deep, six, nearly 7,000 deep, meters deep, uh, 1,000, 2,000 plus meters of, of water uh, drilled. We, we, we hit the reservoir uh, nearly uh, with 38, 39 days. So it's fantastic. We started with three months, uh, just to, to give you a the relationship of the progress. This is the, actually the record, so I'm sharing you the, which probably difficult to replicate, particularly in the medium, in the, in the short term. But that's what, what we are talking about when we talk about the deep end, the deep offshore. This, this diagram, again, is not ours, but is, is uh, in, the, in, in small letters. It is the, I, I can't read from here, but it's Hugh McKenzie. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, uh, that I'm going to explain what it means. No? It means that uh, the big, the big new oil developments uh, that will take place between now and 2020, uh, the each ball, the color, the orange color indicates that uh, that uh, the is the size of it, but the blue within the the blue within that that uh, orange are the reserves that to develop require a price of oil above 80 dollars a barrel. So if you see uh, to, the, to the Gulf of Guinea in Africa, to Brazilian offshore, and to the Gulf of, Gu uh, Gulf of Mexico, and uh, you'll, see, you'll see that uh, the, blue dollar, the blue colors is very small. Uh, the, um, in North America and Europe, uh, the weight of the blue color uh, practically limits the, the, um, the, the profitability of, of those resources. Quite encouraging this for, for the, the companies that, that work in uh, ultra deep offshore in the Atlantic Basin, particularly in the, in the west coast of Africa, in the South, and South America, and also in, uh, in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico. This represents also the, the investments that, uh, that have been made. Nothing special here, uh, but um, saying that uh, uh, of the 15 trillion dollars that the industry has to make, uh, they, they change, they, they are focused uh, in different areas, and in the ultra deep offshore, the industry will be investing, uh, particularly in Africa and uh, Brazil, an average of 150 million billion dollars uh, per year. It's quite quite impressive this number. No? This tells you the number of wells that will be drilled, drilled, drilled uh, offshore. Um, uh, and the rate of growth. So we'll have uh, growing, growing activity in new wells coming on stream, uh, typically with, with material productivity. This uh, also, again, another graph that I wanted to, to retain is that um, is, is, is basically a track record um, of the top explorers as, as uh, whoever prepared this graph called them are the companies that have been involved with these large discoveries um, uh, and how they have, they have uh, discovered these volumes. No? Actually, the names talk by themselves, so I do not repeat that this is a, a slide worth looking at. The, these are all basically spread around the Atlantic Basin, which means that the Atlantic Basin has become is go together, the Atlantic Basin, uh, if we had the unconventionals in the USA, is becoming effectively the source of, of energy, uh, moving away uh, the, the, the focus that the we all have in the industry uh, centered in the Middle East. But this one is a surprise, I can assure you, to most of you. I, I want to, my mother language is Portuguese, 
Uh, and um, we know a company, we say that, uh, that God l is learning Portuguese, no? Because of these graphs. No? Um, if you look at it, let's look to the left hand side. Um, that uh, represents the, of the total discoveries between 206 and 212, uh, 18 plus 29 percent of those took place in Portuguese speaking countries, namely Angola, Mozambique, and Brazil. 29 percent of all the discoveries. If we move away from it to the ultra deep offshore discoveries, which represent, which represent um, nearly more than 50 percent of those you'll see that of those, Brazil, Mozambique, and Angola uh, contributed to 52% of the discoveries in ultra-deep offshore. So whoever is in the ultra-deep offshore business, uh, being as a service providers, equipment manufacturers, or operators, or explorers, ignoring these two uh, countries um, would be missing 50% uh, of the opportunity. But if we zoom again, do, do the same and, um, and look at the, uh, in a different way, you know, which is uh, fundamentally the discoveries that took place just in the last two years, not to go so, so far away as 206, the reality is even is more, 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 more emphatic. You know. uh, in the total discoveries, 35% took place in, in, in these three countries and um, of the ultra deep offshore, uh, 56 percent. So you can see that uh, talking about ultra deep offshore um, developments, uh, effectively these three countries, two in Africa and one in Latin America, are, are critical for the future of the industry. Our company has been privileged, probably because of of our of our history and our uh, activities in this in this in these areas, uh, of being part of this uh, silent. Uh, revolution that is taking place through technology. Fundamentally, this is a technological development, the ability to go so deep in s at, at such a big distance from the coast um, to bring these, uh, these, these, these resources uh, to, 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 off to, to, to the ground. Uh, for those that are not familiar, for instance, with the famous Lula Field, uh, or used to be called the Tupi, uh, it is about 270 kilometers off, off, the, off the coast of Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. So, so uh, uh, the logistics to develop this field is fantastic. And uh, when, we w when we discovered the in 2006, when we participated in the discovery in 2006 of the first, of the first, uh, first major, uh, in the first major discovery in, in that area, um, we said, can we develop it? Can we put together a logistics uh, 270 kilometers uh, off, the off the coast and, um, and uh, work it out in a competitive manner? If you see our own cost, you can see our, annual our quarterly results. We are producing now, we have two, full pro two production systems that full capacity uh, will be developing 10 in the forthcoming, forthcoming uh, uh, six years or so. Um, so we have now a, a very good grasp on the production costs. You simply read our <coughs> quarterly results and the production costs in ultra deep offshore uh, are about seven to eight dollars a barrel. And if you want to talk, add what we call the technical cap capex per barrel produced, you can add another eight. So we're talking about the technical costs close to $15 a barrel and uh, a, a decent remuneration on your capex meeting the minimum cost of capital of a company of our business uh, will, will be about 35 to 40 dollars a barrel. So we can develop this with a decent, a decent uh, return on capital investment um, at that uh, point. And I'm seeing numbers that are um, well known by the financial community. The numbers that are you see are the number of blocks in which our company is involved. We happen to be fundamentally focused on the Atlantic Basin and we pretend to say that we are gaining a lot of experience in uh, ultra deep offshore, both in technologies and, uh, and um, in uh, operations. We are privileged, let me tell you, not to be an operator. We are creating a new model, which is basically an active non-operating partner, a concept that uh, I think we have, are inventing actively every day. Uh, and that gives us uh, uh, the privilege of, of when you have so many issues in our business, 
to choose in agreement with, uh, with the operator which are the areas that we want to focus and the areas where we can add value. So we are doing that in a, in a very, very positive manner mm, uh, and very fruitful. Mm. By the way, that little one close to Australia is another Portuguese-speaking country, it's Timor. Um, God has not been close to them so far, no? but we are, are trying to talk with him. But uh, the remaining areas have been very prolific in geological terms. Uh, in Brazil, everybody has heard about the names, and I'm just going to name them. Mm, fields, gigantic fields in which we are involved. Is Carcara, just a, sh uh, a major discovery occurred three years ago. Is the Tupi, Lula, Iracema, uh, Yara, Jupiter. These are names that that uh, that uh, that uh, I simply refer. The on on this diagram on the left hand side, I don't have a pointer here. Oh yes, I do. Uh, this is the, uh, the Lula. This is one single field. The permeability in the is very low in this area. We actually are arguing with authorities that this is a single reservoir. The authorities want it to be two reservoirs because the taxation regime uh, benefits the government. Uh, there is now a, um, a, a discussion going on. These are the production systems being installed. All of them are ordered. No? In operations, we've got only with the one that we call the Lula, Lula Nordisk, is, uh, this, this, this production system uh, is, uh, this vessel is named Cidade Parati. We've got what we call the Lula, this operation at full capacity. We see no declination, it's been there operating for two years, no, no water. Uh, we've got slightly high CO2 content, but uh, no issue on, on, on CO2. Effectively, we are actually, in this project here, uh, experimenting uh, for I think the first time in history is is uh, injecting what we call the alternate gas and water uh, into the CO2 and water uh, at the reservoir uh, pressure and temperature the, the CO2 is liquid uh, so we, we are doing this for enhancing recovery on the long-term basis and these are the different production systems uh, all of them under under the development and construction I move away from Brazil, and uh, and uh, our company also is now venturing in Morocco, actually as an operator this time, uh, in a conjugate margin to in the in the in the no sorry this is another discovery in Brazil last year, it is not Tupi is 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 uh, is P2 by the way the name of the discovery is a material discovery in this area in the in the conjugate margin to 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 the basin of Nigeria to the Gulf of Guinea is now being appraised, but is a, is a kind of material discovery. Um, in again, uh, now moving to the other side of the Atlantic, also in Ubradip offshore, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, Mozambique, is Area 4. These are the partners in the, in the partnership. Uh, this is uh, the gas in place has, uh, has actually recently increased in a new revision, revision is about about uh, 85 uh, TCFs recoverable, about 70 already proved. So the question now is producing this gas. In Area 1, another consortium with five companies, there are uh, similar dimension of discovery. So a major gas be be province being developed in, in Mozambique. Um, in Angola, I, what we are now, we have, we have a presence there, a historic presence in Angola. Uh, what uh, I do not refer to this, we are, there have been discoveries in, in, in a, in a free south in Angola. Um, we are not present, we are looking at opportunities there, but I have no doubt that that region will uh, replicate, probably with different dimension, the success of, uh, of Brazil. Uh, oh, this is Morocco, I was referring before, where we are drilling again um, uh, another, uh, this is shallow water um, driven prospect quite attractive, let's see what we, we will see. We will be studying this well. Um, this is, is uh, at least uh, as we see it in seismic, is a, is a, is a material prospect that uh, with an attractive tax rate, tax regime. Uh, 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 in Namibia, another again, we have drilled three wells last year in Namibia. Uh, two of them, uh, we, have, we are very proud because we, uh, we wrote off the the three wells, by the way, uh, none of them is commercial, uh, but we, we actually, in both areas, we, 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 we demonstrated the existence of petroleum system, system working. 
there are now neighboring blocks being drilled for us to reassess what to do in this in this project because there is a petroleum system unequivocally working working in the in the deep offshore Namibia. Offshore Portugal, uh, we are now actually we brought these blocks here, where where we are at this moment uh, deciding whether to drill or otherwise uh, into O15 in this area. This is a concrete margin for from Newfoundland uh, with the, all the fundamentals at least uh, to support uh, a, a drilling decision. We are actually farming down part of our large stake in this area. What what uh, do I say that? Uh, that is important in this environment. I would say it is clearly uh, a focus on technological breakthrough, and uh, from the from the from the from the suppliers, the service companies, an importance of solid and robust partnerships, because uh, the risk is high. So the only way we prefer to have 20% uh, equity in five blocks than 100% in one. Is even better if we have 10% in 10. Uh, then one, uh, then then twenty percent in five. So dilute the risk uh, with solid partners. We have been extremely privileged with the quality of partnerships that we managed to put together. Uh, I would say a total commitment to research and development because it's every piece of equipment is is we always are testing it to the, not to the limits because our industry has learned that we never test a test a, a piece of equipment to the limits but to the prudent limits. Um, we need to have skilled people. Um, fortunately, this is a, is a resource that we can afford to have. And by the way, the complexities of projects that were involved it require really sk skill and focus on excellence in project management. Uh, this is one of those somebody did it for me. He, he cons 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 looks from a consultant. So I will, it, I will the major challenge that we, we face, but uh, we simply read them. I don't need to repeat them. But this is the, the, the caliber of the partners that we are privileged to be part of. Um, all of them are, are uh, companies that uh, uh, have contributed to our success in one way or the other. We hope they uh, understand that we also give our contributions to their success. But we have no doubt that they have contributed to our success. So a thank you for those of you that that if any of you work in any of these companies, we owe a lot of what we had to the, to the quality of their professionals. Although I would say with, uh, with, uh, with conviction that we also gave our material contribution to the successes I referred to you. This is what you know. So what we need is, is that, is, is uh, appropriate expertise, is uh, human capital. Uh, and uh, I'm going to refer to human capital and, and leadership one thing I am emphasize is, is the need for for is the need for soft skills as well as technical skills. The projects are so complex, so complex. This de is decision, each decision is so costly that uh, uh, how people interact, which requires soft skills, is of extreme importance. This just reflects the, um, uh, the capex invested in research and development. And set of numbers that make us think. These companies, these are the 10 largest uh, oil and gas companies that most invest in research and development. And um, you look at them, and so, so it's about an average of $1 billion per company. Our little companies, small companies, will be investing about $200 million a year in research and development. Uh, the equipment ma manufacturers also uh, uh, invest a lot. So you can see the challenges that the company face. In short, I would say that, uh, that the research and development for, for these new frontiers require, require commitment to, to pushing technology forward from the operators, from the joint venture partners, as is the case in Brazil, for all partners that are involved. Each one has major, major budgets allocated to research and, devel and development, even as non-operators. Mm, the equipment manufacturers, these are uh, 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 partners for life in these in this projects, as well as the scientific community that we relate with every day. And that's, my friends, what I wanted to share with you. I got signals that I've just met my time. I'm available to Q&A if, uh, if uh, that is time for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Olivado. Just stay with us for giving the audience uh, the opportunity to raise a question. Is there a question? Okay, microphone there, please. Thank you, Mr. 
Thank you, Eric. Very impressive story, very nice. Uh, we will all want to be in your place. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you deal with the risks associated with, with the exploration and development in deep water? After Macondo, we have seen that the partners have been close to you and they were liable as the operators almost. So how did you deal with it? How did you deal in front of any well with the fact that calculating based on the Macondo cost, you come automatically with numbers of a couple of billion euros as potential liability? What I say to our colleagues that, and to myself is that we cannot afford that risk. We will go bankrupt in the next day. So what we, so the, the risk is so high that the cost that we cannot pay. So that's where the, our starting point of thinking. So, so we are, uh, if there is an area where we are focused is on, on safety and, uh, and of the operations. We, um, and uh, we are very fortunate that, I, oh, that we, you see, we learned a lot from Macondo, a lot. I personally, uh, and we owe that to BP, they, if, they, they, if they've done a thing good for the industry was that they put online everything that they were doing. I, the first thing I used to do, I'm the CEO of the company for many years, no? the first thing, I've got a lot of things to do, but the first thing I would do every day during that crisis period was watching what's going on. And if we, what I couldn't see at the start of the working day, I would find somebody in the IT department to let me see it in the evening back home, because I wanted to learn as much as I could personally from it. Second is that we bring that concern every day to the operators, and most importantly to the, the designers. So, so the safety starts in the project itself. Um, so we are extremely careful on it. Uh, and uh, Petrobras, let me tell you, um, I don't know whether somebody from Petrobras here is, a, is probably, uh, which where well most of our exposure is, is, a, is, a, is operating exposure to Petrobras is unequivocally, unequivocally the best uh, ultra deep offshore operator. Is, uh, and we are learning with them every day. And we are influencing on the key, on the key issues. Uh, just um, a little note of thing, these things go, and I, for reasons of, of uh, we do not share operating problems, we also will only share uh, the successes that we have, but sometimes uh, sharing problems is, uh, is more, more transparent and more cooop, more uh, fruitful than sharing successes. One day we were hitting a reservoir um, and we found such a high pressure that uh, we, uh, and I was on the side of the Atlantic, I'm, and immediately I was following what's going on, I have got some experience of drilling, and I said, we have just, just immediately to, and we spend the night uh, recalculating everything, and we asked the, the operator to stop the well next day, and they, they said, thank you, we are, we are going to do that immediately. So, so, the, so, the, so we never take a risk, never take a risk, um, uh, so, so that we have a comfort zone for human failure. That's how, how we do it. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Olivara, uh, just tell us how much production do you have today and what is it that you expect down the line in the next few years? Yeah, you see, we, we started as an expo as exploration and production company in the 60s, 70s uh, in Angola. That's where we learned most of the things that we still know. Uh, our operations were nationalized in Angola when Angola became independent, so we then came to exploration in offshore Portugal. We nearly went bankrupt in the 80s because of it. Uh, then we returned to successful exploration in the mid 90s, um, and uh, today we are producing 30,000 barrels a day. By 2019 we'll be producing 300,000 barrels a day with approved sanctioned projects. So multiplying by 10 our production that is needed. And fortunately, we have a, a very robust balance sheet. We've got people. I think we have access to technology and we have mostly fantastic partners. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.